because another teenager said he stole his backpack. Broderick couldn't afford to pay $10,000 of bail and refused to cop a plea, so he spent three years on Rikers, two of which were in solitary confinement. The charges against him were eventually dropped, but tragically, Broderick committed suicide two years after he was released. Now, do you think a 16-year-old white kid who lived in an affluent neighborhood would have been arrested because another kid said he stole his backpack? This is Edith Perez for WHCR 90.3 FM, New York. In March of 1955, a young black woman shopping near Dexter and Bainbridge across from Dr. Martin Luther King's Church in Montgomery, Alabama, took the city bus home. A young white lady came on that bus and, as was expected, waited for the black woman to get up from her seat. On this day, the black woman refused. Mostly black. Why did you get up when the bus driver asked you to get up? I tell them I could not move because history had me glued to the seat. No, this isn't the story of Rosa Parks, but rather of Claudette Colvin, who was only 15 years old when she was arrested for refusing to give a seat to a white woman in the Jim Crow era South. Colvin's story occurred nine months prior to Parks, and although we don't know her name, she would be the catalyst for the change throughout the United States. Colvin's sister, Gloria Gaston Laster, is disappointed with the way Colvin's case is represented at the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C. Well, actually... My daughter didn't uh, realize what she was seeing. She just said, oh, I'm so excited. And she thought that has been mentioned in the, the museum. And that was her first thought. And she took a screenshot of uh, the plaque, and she emailed it to me. And then when I opened it up, and I saw that the uh, museum, the wording said it was a test case. Uh, and in my mind, you know, my head started spinning out because it wasn't a test case. The test, the case that they were referring to is called the Browder versus Gale case, and I would please ask you to look that up. It's the Browder versus Gale case, and that included four women, Amelia Browder, Susie McDonald, Mary Louise Smith, and Claudette Colvin. Laster and Colvin don't want to take anything away from Rosa Parks, but want to explain why Colvin couldn't be the face of the movement. Rosa had, uh, she was more appealing and she was going to be more acceptable to the white community. So Rosa was groomed for this. She was being taught by um, the, the best of, during that time. And then about nine, uh, uh, a couple of months after all of this happened to my sister, at 15, she became pregnant. And the, the stigma of being pregnant in 1955 uh, was overwhelming. And uh, the ministers and, and the, the, the leaders of that time felt that a 15-year-old and being pregnant, so they, they didn't want to use her. Laster wants history to remember the four women who actually took the Montgomery bus boycott case to trial. Aurelia Brown, Susie McDonald, Mary Louise Smith, and her sister, Claudette Colvin. I, was, I felt disappointed because uh, that they had left part of history out. Mm -hmm. And I felt uh, disappointed because uh, the full, the, uh, what made Dr. King uh, receive the uh, mm -hmm. Nobel Peace Prize mm -hmm. was because of the success of the Montgomery Bus Boycott. Why would you leave out these four women who put their life Oh, this is Christopher Luxama for WHCR 90.3 FM, New York. Traveling to a new country can be exciting, but it can also be quite nerve-wracking. Harlem has its own radio station. Uh, for you and your WHCR. 90.3 FM. The live is party in the whole universe. The Voice of Harlem. The Apollo Theater's annual Kwanzaa Celebration Regeneration Night returns Saturday, December 31st at 7.30 p.m. with a special matinee performance at 2 p.m. Imhotep Gary Bird hosts this evening of dance and music. 
celebrating Kwanzaa principles of family, community, and culture. Performances by Abdel Salam's Forces of Nature Dance Theater and special guests, the Silver Cloud Native American singers and dancers. Tickets are available at Ticketmaster.com. Visit ApolloTheater.org for more information. Welcome to WHCR's Community Calendar, keeping you abreast of events in Harlem and throughout the Tri-State area. The following events will take place from Tuesday, December 6th to Monday, December 12th, 2016. Starting Monday, November 7th through Friday, December 23rd, New York City Health and Hospital's Harlem Hospital will be initiating its annual holiday food drive. Please make sure all foods are non-perishable. All acceptable foods can be dropped off at the food receptacles placed throughout the campus at Harlem Hospital. On Tuesday, December 6th and Thursday, December 8th from 12.15 to 1.15 p.m., relieve stress, focus, and empower with the fundamentals of Siza and the art of sitting in stillness. These classes are taught by Buddhist monk Mickey Nakura and Aaron Davis Hall, Theater C. RSVP at www.citycollegecenterforthearts.org. For more information, call 212-650-6900. On Thursday, December 8th from 6.30 to 9.30 p.m., join the Harlem Congregations for Community Improvement, Home Buyer, Education, and Seminar Series. Get tips on the home buying process, managing your money, and so much more. The seminar will take place at the Dr. Mario Pezzioni Plaza. To register, call 212-281-4887, extension 231. On December 8th at 6 p.m., join members of CCNY's Interactive Poetry Workshop Series presenting their dynamic works alongside noted guest poets, Callaloo Creative Writing Workshop fellow Najee Omar and New York Rican Glam Slam champion finalist Roya Marsh. The slam goes down at Aaron Davis Hall Theater B. For more information, visit CCNY's website and search Interactive Poetry Showcase. On Saturday, December 10th at 1 p.m. is a post-election forum titled The Meaning of Trump's Victory and What's Next? This conversation will be a public forum to discuss the significance of Trump's victory. This all takes place at Freedom Hall on 128th Street. For more information, call 212-222-222. 0633. If you have an event that you would like to place on our community calendar, please call 212-650-7481 or email communitycalendar at whcr.org. Submissions must be made three to four weeks prior to the event. This is Malcolm Smith for WHCR 90.3 FM, the voice of Harlem. In celebration of WHCR's 30th anniversary, we are offering you the opportunity to see the 2016 Tony Award winning Broadway hit, The Color Purple, on Tuesday, December 13th at 7 p.m. Starring Tony and Grammy Award winning powerhouse Jennifer Hudson, The Color Purple is a story of a young woman's journey to love and joy in the American South. The Color Purple is leaving Broadway in less than five weeks, but you don't have to miss it. Tickets for The Color Purple start at $59 and higher, but for your donation of $50, you will receive two tickets. That's The Color Purple, the musical on Broadway. This Tuesday, December 13th at 7 p.m. at the Bernard B. Jacobs Theater, located at 242 West 45th Street in New York. To make your donation, go to www.whcr.org and click on Donation or call 212-650-7147. That's 212-650-7147. Harlem has its own radio station. Uh, for you and your WHCR. 90.3 FM. The loudest party in the whole universe. The Voice of Harlem. Good evening, Harlem. Welcome to Harlem Beat, a show produced by the radio journalism class here in your community at the City College of New York. I'm your host, Shannon Steck. 
President-elect Donald Trump's big business leanings and hyper-capitalistic ideas have continued to divide an already struggling America. Fast food executive Andrew F. Puzder, the man behind Carl Jr.'s and Hardee's, is rumored to be Trump's pick for labor secretary, reinforcing the president-elect's beliefs in a toxic form of capitalism. Routinely taking to Twitter to bash Chuck Jones, president of United Steelworkers on 1999, who Trump believes fostered the environment in which carrier corporation decided to outsource labor to Mexico, Trump has grossly exaggerated the amount of jobs in which his new deal with the state of Indiana, Indiana and carrier will save. Reporter Kibben Aline has the facts on, on the carrier company's move from Indiana and a few other important stories of the day. According to TV1... According to TV1 News Now, CNN faces a class action lawsuit for racial discrimination. The lawsuit alleges that once they're hired, African Americans are held back by an unfair promotion process. African Americans in the company say they are left with little to no room for growth in the company and make much less than their white counterparts. An African American employee taking part in the, in the lawsuit says he had been passed over for promotion nine times. CNN has yet to comment. According to the New York Times, Chuck Jones, president of the United Steelworkers and union chief in Indiana, said that despite Trump's claims that he kept um, 1,100 jobs in Indiana isn't true. Jones says the 350 engineering jobs Trump is taking credit for rescuing are positions that were never scheduled to leave, but there are still 700 jobs planned to go to Mexico. Trump fired back by tweeting, if, union, if United Steelworkers 19, 1999 was any good, they would have kept these, those jobs in Indiana. Spend more time working less. Spend more time working less time talking. Reduce, reduce dues. According to Democracy Now!, Texas Republican Electoral College Representative Christopher Suprun says he will not be voting for Donald Trump on December 19, 2016. In an article in the New York Times, he says he won't vote for Trump because he says he is not qualified for office. Suprun says that the billionaire businessman is divisive and has several conflicts of interest. Of the 50 states in the United States, it is legal for the electors in 29 of those states to not vote for the candidate who won in their state. 21 states do not. It is not illegal in Texas where Suprin is from. Suprin has gotten criticism as well as support from, tele from fellow Texans depending on which side they are on. Suprin's position is in line with the sentiments of one former U.S. president. Former President Alexander Hamilton said, quote, the purpose of the Electoral College is to ensure that the office of the president will, will never fall to the lot of any man who is not in, in an intimate degree endowed with the requisite qualifications, end quote. This is Kibben Aline for WHCR 90.3 FM New York. Back to you, Shannon. As the class divide grows and labor union membership continues to decline, the notion of worker cooperatives is attractive as a way to truly democratize the workplace. We are going to take a quick break, and when we return, reporter Mosiah Sterling will talk to Professor Christopher Michael about worker self-directed enterprises. Right. Good evening, and uh, thank you for joining us. You're listening to Harlem Beat. I'm Isaiah Sterling. Uh, tonight we have with us political scientist, professor of City University of New York, and general counsel of the ICA group, Christopher Michael. He's here to tell us about worker cooperatives and why they're so important to communities throughout America. Uh, Chris Michael, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. All right, so uh, tell us just a little about yourself and your organization, please. Sure thing. Well, first, I just want to say what an honor it is to be here at City College in New York and WHCR 
always have to say that my parents uh, met here, fell in love here, and uh, my mother is a graduate of City College. I can't say the same thing for my father, but I, I'm definitely a product of uh, CCNY. Uh, my organization, oh, my organization, oh, well, okay, now. Uh, so my organization, the ICA Group, uh, it's the oldest nonprofit in the country that's dedicated to employee ownership and worker cooperatives. Uh, we were founded in 1977. Uh, and what we do uh, in the main is we help existing healthy companies transition to, uh, transition to worker ownership of one form or another. Uh, I'm actually also a student at CUNY. I'm um, finishing a PhD here right now, and I also went to CUNY Law School as well, and I specifically went to law school to help worker-owned businesses and to help create worker-owned businesses. Okay. Um, so, all right. so for all those who, who have never heard of it, please explain. You know, what, what exactly is a, a worker cooperative? How does it work? Sure thing. Well, you know, one, one thing is I really have come, you know, I've been working in this space for about seven, eight years now, and I've really come to sort of the, the sense that the word cooperative is kind of an anachronism um, today. Mm -hmm. uh, when you use the word cooperative uh, around the country in New York City, people often think of the you know, quintessential hippie food co-op. And that's just really, I don't think, representative of the full vision that we can accomplish in this space of employee ownership. A lot of people don't realize that uh, John Lewis Partnership, which is in the United Kingdom, has about 90, 95,000 employees, and it's entirely in that language of work, worker self-directed enterprise. It is, you know, uh, it is an employee-owned, an employee-controlled enterprise. Um, uh, 95,000 people, and it's the equivalent of, you know, a Target in the U.S., or for New Yorkers, it's the equivalent of Macy's or Bloomingdale's. But 95,000 people, partners sharing in the profits of the business, building a culture, a workplace culture that's suitable to them, that fits them, that makes everyone feel like they're equals. But at the same time, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it has a governance structure, a management structure, that allows all of the employees to vote together to elect the top management of the enterprise. Okay. Um, so, so can you just tell our viewers a little bit about how, how, are, how are they organized usually? Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, there are about and so in the country, speaking very broadly again about the space of employee-owned businesses, the most typical structure in the United States for an employee-owned business, mm -hmm. there are about seven thousand of them, uses something called an employee stock ownership plan, also called an ESOP, that's been around since 1974, and that uses a trust. Uh, to hold shares on behalf of employees, mm -hmm. and a company can be 30%, 10%, 51%, 100% owned by this employee stock ownership plan on behalf of the employees. Mm -hmm. um, that's the most typical structure, and it was, it was brought into law, so oddly enough, uh, under Richard Nixon in 1974. Okay, and, and you know, for people who aren't familiar with it, how do you feel that worker cooperatives can benefit mm -hmm. workers Mm -hmm. uh, first and foremost, mm -hmm. you know, their, their economic interests more so than, you know, uh, executives. Sure thing. So uh, if, it's, if it's sort of a, 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 a true and pure employee-owned uh, business where uh, employees have uh, voting rights of the corporation, well, one of the first things that you're likely to find in any employee-owned business where voting rights are passed through to the employees is a more level or equal pay structure. So, for example, the very famous employee-owned business in Spain called the Mondragon Corporation, they have an eight-to-one pay structure. So the, the senior, se senior most CEO of the entire group of enterprises is not going to get paid more than eight times mm -hmm. at the last figure that I knew, eight times what the most what the lowest paid employee is. You know, in America today, you often you not often, but you do have occasion extreme instances where the, the CEO might get paid four hundred four hundred and fifty times what the lowest paid employee is. And then another aspect of the financial benefit, of course, is that the profits are distributed. So separate from the wages, the profits are shared, distributed in a f in a more or less egalitarian fashion to all of the employees. And that's true in ESOP companies, that's true in, in sort of more, you know, in, 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 and that's true in empl employee-owned enterprises broadly. Okay, so to be clear, um, even in a, in a worker cooperative, executives can still make more money than um, their employees, but they have more say in the level of uh, uh, pay that everybody gets. Right, so all of the, so in a, in a kind of a pure employee-owned enterprise, all of the employees would be able to elect the board of directors and the management, and that management would set the, the, the wage scale. But of course, you're going to vote or elect a director who's going to represent your interests as a worker mm -hmm. and is going to set a pay scale that's going to be more or less fair to everybody. Um, however, we do exist in the society that we exist. The market conditions are the way they are, and it might be very difficult to attract a very high-quality 
a skilled professional or top manager to the firm if they're if everyone's going to get paid the same level amount, right? right. Um, so for that very reason, there are uh, there is a recognition of the of the market realities and 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 there's a ability there is that ability to to accord different salaries to different to different uh, respond you know roles within the firm. Yes. Okay, so do you feel that worker cooperatives can play a huge role in sort of ending poverty, uh, leveling out uh, economic disparities mm -hmm. in, in various communities in the United mm -hmm. States? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, 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 one thing, so one thing that we've seen demonstrated over the last 40 years, and this is not sort of, ima this is not imagination, this is actual reality today, is that right now in the U.S. today there are 7,000 companies with ESOP employee ownership plans. Mm -hmm. um, about 4,000 of those are majority ESOP, majority employee-owned entities. There are about 13 and a half million employees that have some kind of employee stock ownership participation in their companies. Um, and, uh, you know, when you look at the declining representation in unions, um, uh, 13.5, that's, that's about, I think, the same or slightly more than the number of private sector workers that are currently unionized. So it's not far-fetched. It's not, it's not totally far-fetched to suppose that um, expanding employee ownership might be a means of improving worker representation and worker control of enterprises in a way that supplements the, the unions or the role that unions have played historically over the last hundred or so years. Um, okay. But, uh, so what, what are some challenges that uh, a, a worker cooperative may face maybe when they're first forming or even, mm -hmm. um, you know, moving forward right. afterwards? Well, so I think one thing that a lot that that in my sort of you know experience in activism and in community organizing over the last seven or eight years uh, is that a lot of people look to um, starting an employee-owned enterprise, or a lot of people want to start you know quote unquote start a quote unquote worker cooperative. Um, that's actually n that's actually not how employee ownership is created by and large, certainly in the United States. Mm. Um, in the United States, the way that employee-owned enterprises are established is typically by uh, transitioning an existing healthy business um, over into employee ownership. Often you have you know. For in the life cycle of every company, an owner is going to retire, is going to sell. Uh, family businesses, uh, while it's often in people's imagination that they might build a business and pass it down to their children, family business successions typically are not successful, and that's that's the recorded, you know, statistically. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, employee ownership is created as a matter of historical record of the last forty years, uh, most frequently by transitioning over existing healthy companies. Okay, so how have um, elected officials here in New York and wherever else, uh, how have they uh, responded to, to, to worker cooperatives? So, so one of the great things about employee ownership, uh, odd from my perspective to some extent, but I, I can understand why, uh, has, has always, or since, since 1974, been a bipartisan issue. It's something that Democrats and Republicans can agree on. So ERISA was passed under Nixon. Uh, ESOP legislation at, in Congress, in U.S. Congress, uh, significantly expanded under Ronald Reagan, again, something that I find personally surprising, but nevertheless, uh, it did expand under Reagan. And Republicans right now today uh, in the Republican Party national platform includes employee ownership. Um, it's something that we found in Bernie Sanders' platform, uh, economic policy platform, and it's something that we find in the Republican National Party platform. Uh, so there are a lot of substantial tax benefits available under federal tax law. Uh, in New York State, I've been fortunate enough to have a lot of really great conversations with state senators, state lawmakers, and also city council members, very importantly. City Council of New York has been a huge support to employee ownership. Uh, they have provided several millions of dollars to various initiatives, nonprofit initiatives, to build or to create employee-owned businesses in New York City. Uh, uh, w uh, it may be fair to say that without uh, their support, I might not be sitting here right now with, with you guys. I might have to focus on, on other, other, other areas, but thanks to the support, I'm able to be here. Um, at the state level, uh, you know, from, from research, uh, it, it's it, we s sort, of, sort of, I discovered that we've actually have uh, a whole generation before us. In 1983, we had a number of really fantastic laws that were put on the books here in New York State. Right now, we're working to get those laws reactivated, so I've been having a lot of conversations with uh, New York State senators, New York State assembly members, about reactivating 
uh, Employee Ownership Assistance Program, uh, the State Employee Ownership Center, and also we have a bill in the Assembly right now with Assembly Member Sean Ryan, um, A9618, and that would provide for additional tax incentives, educational incentives, procurement incentives, and consider uh, refunding the State Center. So there's been a lot of, a lot of great response from lawmakers. Okay. I mean, you mentioned Sean Ryan. Uh, who are some public figures that have been, you know, huge advocates and great supporters of, of, of worker co-ops? Uh, well, uh, you know, again, sort of odd. It's odd to mention, but uh, there's, you know, you can all Google on YouTube. Uh, Ronald Reagan gives a great speech about employee ownership, and he says that he sees the future of America going in this direction. That will be the future, is a future of employee-owned businesses. Mm -hmm. um, uh, another sort of notable, you know, okay, so I'm going to put my political science hat on for a moment. A moment. It was maybe sort of the grandfather of, uh, I don't know if that's a sort of overly gendered term there, but the grandfather of American political science, uh, Yale University professor Robert Dahl, who just passed away recently, wrote a really wonderful, eloquent, even poetic book called A Preface to Economic Democracy, in which he put forth a vision of the future, you know, economic system of a democratic nation. Uh, to be one where an employee-owned, a self-governing enterprise would be the standard or the norm. So those are two important figures in, in, uh, in U.S. history. Okay. Um, so once again, you're listening to Harlem Beat. I'm Isaiah Sterling. I'm here with Professor Christopher Michael. Uh, we're talking about worker co-ops. These are businesses that are owned, ran, not owned, ran by uh, employees rather than uh, executives. Okay, and uh, over 7,000 companies have already adapted this business model. It's really moving forward. All right, so let's talk about, um, you know, moving forward mm -hmm. uh, with this new administration mm -hmm. as far as jobs and economy. Mm -hmm. So during his campaign, you know, President-elect Donald Trump, he has spoken a lot about job growth mm -hmm. in America, you know, especially in low-income communities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, usually revolves around lowering taxes, you know, uh, for corporations, and limiting trade regulations, empowering private and charter mm -hmm. schools. Mm -hmm. uh, so given the opportunity, what would you tell our next administration? I'll just say that I think uh, President-elect Trump is going to be a great, great champion mm -hmm. for employee ownership, and I think he's going to do great, great things to build employee ownership in this country. Okay. Um, would you make any suggestions as far as sort of pushing for this model more so than um, sort of private uh, business ownership? Yeah, this is a more fair model. It's mm -hmm. something that anybody could recognize. It's obvious on its face. It's something that shares rewards, responsibilities equally mm -hmm. among all the people who share in the burdens and the labor of the enterprise. It's something that recognizes that frontline employees have something to contribute and top-level executives have something to contribute. Okay, all right. And do you feel, again, that moving forward, seeing that th the way that this uh, administration is being mm -hmm. formed, that worker co-ops can improve in the next four to eight years? I think employee ownership is going to be huge over the next four to eight years. I think there's a lot of momentum building, and I think, uh, if anything, President-elect Trump is just going to do really fantastic things for employee ownership. Okay, uh, so let's, let's talk about how um, worker co-ops are working overseas. Again, you mentioned this before, but in Spain and Italy, how have these uh, business models been improving? So again, we have, uh, you know, often not recognized, but John Lewis Partnership is a 95,000 person employee owned business, the equivalent of a Target or a Walmart or a Macy's. Uh, they sell, uh, you know, high end goods. They say they have a supermarket r chain related to them. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, been in trust for the employees and directed by the employees since, the, since I believe, the 1920s. Um, so that's a phenomenal business. It's a great business, and it's one that we should all look toward. Um, another really famous, world-famous sort of example is the Mondragon Corporation, based in the Basque region of Spain. I had the great honor and pleasure of visiting this past summer and spending a month there with my wife in the famous town of Guernica, with the Pablo Picasso painting, sort of in the heart of the Basque region. And uh, yeah, they have over 80,000 uh, employees, uh, employee owners, of this Mondragon Corporation with about 100 or so companies. They, they're they actually an international company with sort of uh, locations all around the world, uh, one of the largest conglomerates in Spain. They have one of the largest banks in Spain. Uh, and, and, and it's really just been a phenomenal uh, thing that's transpired over the last half a century. 
Um, in Italy, you have another entire phenomenon, sort of post-war growth of employee-owned businesses. You have about a million employee owners uh, uh, by, by most counts. Okay. Um, so uh, for, for people who are interested in starting their own uh, worker co-op, how, how would you get this started? So I would really think twice about starting your own uh, employee-owned business uh, for, for many, many reasons that would be difficult to get into right now. Uh, I think that if you're interested in employee ownership, you should think about reaching out to friends and family. You should think about family members, friends that might own their own businesses, that might be looking to retire in the next 5, 10, 15 years. You might have them look at our website, icagroup.org. You might have them look at the website of the National Center for Employee Ownership, nceo.org, and have them find out more about what this employee ownership thing is all about and how they can retire, retire well, pull the money out of the business that they're owed in building that business, actually make more money by transitioning to employee ownership, but then do the right thing by their employees, do the right thing by their top managers, and also keep the legacy of that business alive for the future. All right. All right. That'll do it. Thank you, uh, Mr. Michael, uh, for joining us. Thank uh, you. Talking to us on Harlem Beat. Back to you, Shannon. Thank All you, right. Mazaya, And thank you, Professor Michael, for your insights. Tonight's headline reporter is Kibben Ali. Feature reporter was Mazaya Sterling. Our board operator is Omar Nicodemo, assisted by WHCR's production manager, Tina Dixon. I'm your host, Shannon Steck. Thank you, Harlem, for lending your ears to listen to your beat, and have a happy Thursday. This is a journey into sound. We are on the air. Keep this frequency clear. Do not attempt to adjust your dad. Don't, don't touch that dial. Dial. Keep it locked on WHCR 90.3 FM. You need to keep it locked. The voice of Harlem. Turn it up. In celebration of WHCR's 30th anniversary, we are offering you the opportunity to see the 2016 Tony Award-winning Broadway hit, The Color Purple, on Tuesday, December 13th at 7 p.m., starring Tony and Grammy Award-winning powerhouse Jennifer Hudson. The Color Purple is a story of a young woman's journey to love and joy in the American South. The Color Purple is leaving Broadway in less than five weeks, but you don't have to miss it. Tickets for The Color Purple start at $59 and higher, but for your donation of $50, you will receive two tickets. That's The Color Purple, the musical on Broadway. This Tuesday, December 13th at 7 p.m. at the Bernard B. Jacobs Theater, located at 242 West 45th Street in New York. To make your donation, go to www.whcr.org and click on Donation or call 212-650-7147. That's 212-650-7147. Welcome to WHCR's Community Calendar, keeping you abreast of events in Harlem and throughout the tri-state area. 
The following events will take place from Tuesday, December 6th to Monday, December 12th, 2016. Starting Monday, November 7th through Friday, December 23rd, New York City Health and Hospitals Harlem Hospital will be initiating its annual holiday food drive. Please make sure all foods are non-perishable. All acceptable foods can be dropped off at the food receptacles placed throughout the campus at Harlem Hospital. On Tuesday, December 6th and Thursday, December 8th from 12.15 to 1.15 p.m., relieve stress, focus, and empower with the fundamentals of Siza and the art of sitting in stillness. These classes are taught by Buddhist monk Mickey Nakura and Aaron Davis Hall, Theater C. RSVP at www.city College Center for the Arts.org. For more information, call 212 650 6900. On Thursday, December 8th, from 6 30 to 9 30 p.m., join the Harlem Congregations for Community Improvement, Home Buyer, Education, and Seminar Series. Get tips on the home buying process, managing your money, and so much more. The seminar will take place at the Dr. Mario Pezzioni Plaza. To register, call 212 212- 281-4887, extension 231. On December 8th at 6 p.m., join members of CCNY's interactive poetry workshop series presenting their dynamic works alongside noted guest poets, Callaloo Creative Writing Workshop fellow Najee Omar and New York Glam Slam champion finalist Roya Marsh. The slam goes down at Aaron Davis Hall Theater B. For more information, visit CCNY's website and search Interactive Poetry Showcase. On Saturday, December 10th at 1 p.m. is a post-election forum titled The Meaning of Trump's Victory and What's Next. This conversation will be a public forum to discuss the significance of Trump's victory. This all takes place at Freedom Hall on 128th Street. For more information, call 212-222-0633. If you have an event that you would like to place on our community calendar, please call 212-650-7481 or email communitycalendar at whcr.org. Submissions must be made three to four weeks prior to the event. This is Malcolm Smith for WHCR 90.3 FM, the voice of Harlem. The Apollo Theater's annual Kwanzaa Celebration Regeneration Night returns Saturday, December 31st at 7.30 p.m. with a special matinee performance at 2 p.m. Imhotep Gary Bird hosts this evening of dance and music, celebrating Kwanzaa principles of family, community, and culture. Performances by Abdel Salam's Forces of Nature Dance Theater and special guests, the Silver Cloud Native American Singers and Dancers. Tickets are available at Ticketmaster.com. Visit ApolloTheater.org for more information. Brother Bill here inviting you to join us on the 3G Experience on Thursday mornings from 6 a.m. to 10 for the best in gospel and inspirational music on the 3G Experience. Good music, high praise, and surprise guests every Thursday morning from 6 a.m. to 10. Listen on Terrestrial Radio at 90.3 FM or on the Internet at www.whcr.org. The 3G Experience, Thursday mornings with Brother Bill, 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. God bless your heart. 